There we go. Welcome to AEM in the community. We're going to learn about accessible educational materials in your own community. So I am Carrie Luce. I am an occupational therapist and an assistive technology professional, and I'm the director of the AT Lab, the Assistive Technology Lab at Community Vision. We'll show you more about that. We also have Noelle and Cynthia here. Noelle, if you can introduce yourself. Hey there, I'm Noelle Berkey. I'm the assistant director at the AT Lab, and I'm also a speech language pathologist. Hi, everybody. My name is Cynthia Castaneda. I am a disability specialist here at the lab and also a speech language pathology assistant. Great, thank you. So we're here at Community Vision in Portland, Oregon. Community Vision has a variety of programs and services for people with disabilities. One of our programs is the AT Lab, the Assistive Technology Lab. We're an education and resource center. We do a lot around AT. We have a website. Please check us out. It's cv-atlab.org. We offer trainings and workshops, consultations. We have open hours to the public. We have a loan closet. So please check us out on our website. We have an accessibility commitment today that we um, used CAST's version of their commitment, and we use that as a reference. Um, so today we are committed to providing you with an accessible presentation where we have alt text on images for people that use screen readers. We have high color contrast, readable font. For each slide, there's a unique title. We provide shortened links with descriptive back halves. Hopefully we have a clear flow and layout for you a consistent format, clear use of images, video with closed captioning, and we used an accessibility checker. So uh, today we are gonna talk about AEM. We're also gonna talk about the ADA, the American with Disabilities Act. We're gonna talk about what does AEM look like in the community? If you're out in the community, what tools can you bring with you for accessibility? We'll talk a little bit about how you can advocate for yourself. And also we'll touch on what is community vision doing to help promote accessibility in the community with businesses, organizations, and government. And then we have some resources that we like that we'll share. Okay, so most of you know what AEM is, Accessible Educational Materials, but we have the definition here. It's print and technology-based educational materials, including printed and electronic textbooks and related core materials that are designed or enhanced in a way that make them usable across the widest range of learner variability. And this is a legal definition, regardless of format. So print, digital, graphic, audio, or video. And this includes accessible formats as defined under the US copyright laws. So there's just a brief description of what AEM is. It's a term used in schools. So now we're gonna talk about, well, what are educational materials in the community? Basically, it's any media that you use to learn when you're out and about, wherever you're visiting. There might be a brochure, you watch a video, there's a book that gives you information, a chart, anything really when you're out in the community and you're learning information. So we're gonna touch on two laws here that protect your rights as a person with a disability in accessing materials or if you support someone who has a disability. It's good to know your rights and the laws. So you all have heard about IDEA. It's the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act that was passed in 1975. It was reauthorized in 2004 and it, to include AEM, among other things. If you're outside of school and you're out in the community somewhere and you have a disability, your rights to accessing materials are protected by the ADA, which is the American with Disabilities Act, which was passed in 1990, and it was revised in 2010 to include effective communication. We're gonna talk more about that. So we have Cynthia here, our accessibility specialist at the lab who knows a lot about the ADA. So Cynthia, can you tell us more about effective communication? Sure. Um... Well, as you may or may not know, the overall goal of the ADA is to provide people with disabilities an equal opportunity to access the goods or services that they offer. So this requirement applies to state and local governments, 
businesses, nonprofit organizations, they're all required to provide effective communication with anyone who has a communication disability. The only exceptions would be religious organizations and private clubs. So somebody who has vision, hearing, or speech disabilities, or as you can call communication disabilities, um, they use different ways to communicate. So for example, someone um, who's blind may give or receive information audibly rather than in writing. And someone who is deaf may receive information and give information through writing or sign language. So let's dig in and see some of the requirements of effective communication. So effective in communication, it ensures that anyone with vision, hearing, or speech disability can communicate with and receive information from any covered entity. Uh, covered entities, what must they provide? They must provide auxiliary aids and services. So this means it can be anything from braille materials to qualified sign language interpreters. Uh, this can be in person or through remote interpreting services. You have note takers and much more. So another important thing to consider is when providing effective communication is considering the nature, the length, the complexity, and the context of the communication. So, for example, somebody ordering at a restaurant, their option would be have the person, if they are blind, they can have the person or their waiter read the menu to them. Um, but for somebody, say, who is Staff going to the doctor's office, they wouldn't necessarily get away with just passing notes to each other. So an interpreter would be a better fit for this case. And the rules of com communication, effective communication um, don't only apply to the person who is receiving the services. They can apply also to the parents, the spouse, or companion. For example, if you have a deaf parent attending an IEP meeting, they would also need to be provided with effective communication. And if you want to learn more about effective communication, you can visit the live link down at the bottom of this slide. Thank you, Cynthia. Okay, so basically we're always learning in life. As soon as you step outside the school walls, you can still continue to learn. On the weekend, you might go to the library, you might go to a museum, out in the community. We're always learning. And we don't stop learning after graduation. So what are some places in the community that we visit and learn? Let's see some examples. Oh, whoops, we did have a list here. Um, the library, a museum, doctor's office, going to the bank, a garden store, really anywhere out in the community where you're learning information. And it happens more than you might think. So now we'll look at some examples. So we started with, whoops, somehow my slides keep skipping. Um, we started with the library. The library is such a great resource and has so much information. There's so much learning that can happen at the library. So we are lucky to have John Worona here today from our local library here in Portland, which is the Multnomah County Library. Um, John, I'll let you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about some of the ways that people can access materials at your library system. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for having me today, having the library here. Uh, my name is John Warona. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the Director of Innovation and Technology for the Multnomah County Library System. And I'm also the sponsor of the Disability Accommodations Group, which is a, a work group in the library that works on assistive technology and um, and services. So I um, wanted to talk to you a little bit today about um, uh, sort of uh, a, a, an overview of some of the things we provide, but then also um, to get into a couple of um, illustrative examples. <clears throat> so um, in general, 
we uh, we provide some services for blind and low vision. Um, I do manage technology, public technology. So that includes uh, JAWS screen reader software on our public access computers and Zoom text, and um, uh, which is screen magnification, um, CCTV, um, magnification of physical materials and um, DVDs with audio description. Uh, we also have um, uh, uh, something called Bookshare, which is accessible eBooks. Uh, we'll talk about that um, a little bit more in a minute. Um, services for deaf and hard of hearing include um, large print and audio books, um, ASL interpreters, uh, both in person or um, via um, um, a, a virtual um, service. Uh, we've got assistive listening devices. We'll go into a little more detail about those and DVDs with closed captions, et cetera. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we uh, also provide some hardware, some assistive uh, technology uh, like uh, large keyboards with, with large print um, letters uh, on, on the actual keys, uh, trackball mice for mobility uh, disabilities, um, and high, low service stations, so sit-stand desks. And uh, we're starting to get into more um, sensory uh, supports um, with sensory kits and sensory story time, and even some sensory rooms in some of our new in some of our new buildings. Um, I say new buildings because um, we are embarking on a library building bond program. You may know that because you may your local library might be closed for renovations right now, um, and that's um, and that's because it it might be uh, being um, renovated or built brand new. So uh, let's get into some of the examples um, and we'll start off with um, assistive listening devices because that's something we're really committed to in, in our new libraries. Um, so with this slide, you'll see a picture of an assistive listening device. Um, it's a transceiver, meaning it transmits and receives sound and has um, a microphone and an earpiece. And um, we've got some new signage to go with these devices. And uh, we've got a picture here of, uh, of um, our test subject um, who is working with this new technology. Um, this is something that we had piloted before our library building renovations with mobile kits. Um, and now we're really leaning into it with our library building bond program and actually building in some of this functionality into uh, some of our larger community rooms. So you're looking here at a, a, a mobile kit, but in some of our new spaces, including the building I'm in today, which is not a public building, but it's a new operations center at the corner of Gleason and 122nd, um, we've embedded um, an inductive loop into some of the bigger training rooms. And that'll be true in some of our bigger um, community rooms uh, in libraries, which um, allows for devices uh, to connect to the signal that's being transmitted over that loop. In fact, if you've got a hearing aid that has the telecoil option, you can tune in to that audio signal just by switching to that, that T mode. All right, let's move on to another example and take a look at our audio visual tech cart or Ava, audio visual assistant, we call her. Um, this adds accessibility features to our meetings. Um, one example is um, American Sign Language via video remote interpretation. So we actually subscribe to a service that allows us to um, dial up um, a interpreter um, who's there on video um, interpreting for deaf patrons or deaf staff. Um, this device can also be used for live captioning. We could invite someone to a meeting like this Zoom meeting, invite an interpreter to the meeting, and they could actually type live captions, um, large and in, in high contrast on this device. Excuse me. Um, Let's move on to um, our, our next um, specific example, which is Bookshare. Many of you are probably aware of Bookshare. Bookshare is a, 
um, accessible ebook um, platform that has thousands and thousands <clears throat> of uh, ebooks um, that are um, that are accessible um, uh, in the in the Daisy format. I think it's called. Um, they also it, they work with screen readers um, and they work with um, um, uh, Braille uh, enabled devices. And um, Bookshare is is actually federally funded and is available to enrolled students in K-12 or college or in adult education. But if they're not in school, it would cost them out of pocket to access these accessible books. So the library has um, subscribed to some licenses and we can make those available to community members who are not enrolled um, in, a, in an educational program right now through a simple application process um, for their eligibility. And the last specific example we want to talk about here, um, uh, excuse me, uh, was Morphic, um, which is a web accessibility um, toolbar that we've put on our public access computers. And um, what this does is it really um, exposes the built-in accessibility features that are available um, with modern operating systems like um, Windows 11. Many of you are probably um, well aware of those and how to you know, enable those um, for yourself or for, um, for your clients and patrons and students. But um, this kind of makes it very visible, easy to find, easy to use, to do things like um, change the text size, magnify the whole screen, um, copy and paste, um, provide that that um, screen reader functionality, uh, sort of right out of the box, right out of the operating system and change color and contrast and um, sort of that go into night mode, um, which a lot of folks like, um, it's a little easier on the eyes. So, um, you know, it's, it's an accessibility tool, but like many of our building bond um, program um, accessibility innovations, we're really thinking in terms of universal design and how this can really help um, many people um, who wouldn't um, necessarily identify as having a disability, but um, could, could benefit from some of these features. So um, we're really excited about um, these developments and you know, uh, we really consider it just, um, just the beginning of, uh, of a transformation here at the library. Yay, thank you, John, so much for sharing. We're so happy that you were with us today. Um, the tools that you saw today that Multnomah County Library has may or may not be available in your county. Every county is different, but um, we feel that Multnomah County is leading the way with accessibility in libraries. So if you saw something here today that you think is cool and your county library doesn't have it, this is something you can advocate for. Um, we are big fans of Morphic. It's a very cool tool. So um, there's a plug for that. So thanks, John. Okay, so we learn at the library, but we also learn in other places in the community. A great place to learn is at museums. So again, here in our county, um, in Portland, we have the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry. Many of you might know OMSI. Um, so we just learned that OMSI has some really cool accessibility tools. So for folks who are blind or have low vision, um, OMSI offers a free subscription to the IRA app. So the IRA app is a free app that you can download, but you have to pay for the subscription for it to work. And what it is, it's free live visual interpretation. So you call in from your smartphone anywhere that you are, and you can get live visual interpretation about the environment, what is around you. Um, so OMSI has paid for a subscription for anyone that is around their building. And so they've actually created a geofence around their building. And there's a picture of a map here on the screen that shows you where the app works. So OMSI is down on the Southeast waterfront here in Portland. And when you get off the Max or the bus, um, the app should start working right away. And um, you can call in. And if you don't have your own smartphone, then you may borrow one from OMSI. So it's a really cool service that they offer. Um, some other things that OMSI offers is in their theater, they have the empirical theater at the OMSI, big, huge screen, very cool theater. Um, for folks that are deaf or hard of hearing, they offer CaptiView 
closed caption devices. And there's a picture here of a gentleman in the theater. You can see what it looks like. It's a little um, screen that's in front of you on an arm, and then it will caption the movie for you. They also offer presentation scripts, so you can request those. They have sound neck loops that work with your hearing aids, and they also offer volume amplification units. For folks that are blind or low vision, in addition to the IRA app, they also have audio description units that can be used in their theater. So if a museum near you does not have these things, you could advocate and um, see if your museum could get some of these things, especially if they have a theater or your local movie theater. So a lot of movie theaters have the captive view now. Okay, so many folks may have heard of the Louvre Museum in Paris, one of the most famous museums in the world. So here we have Anthony Ferraro. He, we're gonna see a Facebook reel of his. And so he describes himself as an athlete who is blind and has a strong social media presence detailing life as a blind person. So here he is at the Louvre. He is in their brand new tactile room where they have tactile maps, audio headphones, braille, and more. So let's listen to um, Anthony tell us about the tactile room at the, at the Louvre. Go to the Louvre. I'm not going to be able to see anything. They're supposed to have this tactile room with Braille and sculptures. Really, I do not like art museums. There's a Braille tactile map. I actually feel the Mona Lisa. I didn't know this was going to be possible. This key tells you what each material is. The Braille's in France, but that's okay. I get to keep it with me the whole tour so I can see what everything feels like. Do the tactile room. I think this is it. What is it? Dude, there's Braille on the side. Late Freud du Bronze. It's made out of bronze. Does that mean the staff? Yo. Oh my gosh, the head moves. The nose and the ears. Are these pigtails? Wait, what do these do? Louis the 14th? You are a splendid statue. What is this? Oh, it's a fort. Oh, this is what it was talking about. Yeah. This is Louis on the horse. Still there. Bro, that was <laughs> curls. What is this? This is really cool because it describes everything and then you get to touch it. And there's so much braille. Can you feel the wings on my back? Yeah, do feel the wings on your back. Do the Mona Lisa. Feel this guy's toe. Down, down, left. Feel all his toes. All right. The place feels unreal. Looks cool. Mona Lisa. Mona Lisa. They're putting us in this private elevator. I really love accessibility. This is the coolest elevator I've ever been in. Feels like we're in a hot airport. This is so lovely. That was one move. I'm fine. Let's go to the loo. We're not going to be. Okay, well, thank you, Anthony. That is just so cool to see um, such a well-known, famous museum leading the way in accessibility. So check out Anthony Ferraro on Facebook. Okay, more places that you can learn when you're out in the community. Again, you might not realize how much there is to learn as soon as we step outside our door. So if you're visiting your doctor or even at the dentist, you're often getting patient education. Doctors are explaining things, dentists are explaining things, um, and you're learning about your healthcare. So one thing that Community Vision does has done to um, promote accessibility in healthcare is we partnered with OHSU, which is the Oregon Health and Sciences University, um, on a grant to create symbol-based patient decision guides or personal decision guides. And these are guides that are used in medicine and they help people make decisions about their healthcare. Well, we helped create um, a visual based, a symbol supported guide for people that really benefit from visual supports when they're learning. Or if someone can't read and someone else reads them the decision guide, there are visuals to go along with it. So that's just one example of um, something that we've been doing to help kind of move the needle around healthcare accessibility. And there is a link here if you would like to see the decision guides on the OHSU website. So if you go to the bank, you may be making a quick deposit or you might be getting information on um, how to get a loan, how to save money. Again, we learn so much when we're out in the community. So we thought we'd share one resource um, about learning about money management. So this tool was created by the Pennsylvania Assistive Technology Foundation. We have a live link here. It's just a really cool tool and we wanted to share it. It's very accessible. 
Um, it's written in plain language. It has clear layout, clear visuals, and it's called Sense and Sensibility, a guide to money management. So that was created again by the Pennsylvania AT Foundation. Um, and we're just going to show you a quick peek of some of the things that are in this guide, just because we think it's so cool. Um, so this guide could be used with students in a transition program, could be used with adults, just so many different folks. But um, it goes over so many things around money management, such as saving, borrowing, buying a home, and more. And um, if there are any teachers out there, again, in a transition program, or even younger, please check out um, studymoney.us. That's the companion guide that goes with Sense and Sensibility, and it adapts a lot of the materials in here. So we're just giving a plug for this resource that we thought was super cool. So one question we get a lot is, um, you know, what if I'm out in the community and I'm, you know, at a doctor's office or a museum or at the garden store or somewhere, and there's information that I want to um, read or access, um, but it's not accessible, what can I do? So if you do have your own mobile device, then there's some um, tips that we have here. So Cynthia, if you don't mind telling us about um, these ideas that we have here, that would be great. Sure. So if you're out in the community and you can't find accessible materials, you have a few options that are built into your mobile device. So if you have a mobile device, you can try an accessibility setting such as the magnifier, which most phones have. So if you need to take a picture of something, you can zoom into it, read the small print, or you can just use the magnifying glass to read something. Um, we also can use live captioning. So for someone who's hard of hearing, this provides subtitles when you're listening to something on your phone, like watching the reel. Um, it also can caption live conversations. So this might vary on devices and settings. And we have one more app to talk about. So you may have seen seeing AI in an earlier presentation today. Um, it's a free app that narrates the world around you. What's neat about it is that it's free. Um, you can use it to scan barcodes to identify an object that you're trying to figure out if it's the right one. It's useful for identifying currencies, different types of bills you have, and also reading a book, magazine. Another neat feature is that it you can have it recognize people's express, facial expressions. Um, it'll remember people's faces, so you can keep track of that. Um, and it also describes scenes around you. Right. Cool. That's well, it. thank you, Cynthia. So there's a couple of tips if you're out in the community and need to access materials. Um, another question we get a lot is, well, what if I don't have my own mobile device? So there are a lot of different funding options in Oregon, um, and it depends on the purpose of the device, who's using it. Um, but there are many funding options, either through the state, state and state services, the county, schools, charity, medical, and more. Um, so feel free to visit our AT funding site to get more information if, you, if you'd like. Um, so if you go to our website, there's a little blue button at the top called AT funding, and you can check out more about that or give us a call. Okay, so if you're out in the community um, and you need to access materials, you can advocate for yourself. So the first step is to know how you learn best. Do you learn well through auditory listening, tactile visual videos, graphics, or more? So know yourself as a learner. If you have students that you're supporting, help them know um, how they learn best. Know what accommodations you need. Bring tools with you if you have them. And if you need help, speak up. So what else is Community Vision doing to help with accessibility in the community? Well, we have some resources and they'll be on the resource list. Um, two of them here are we don't have live links for, so you could email us. 
So the two on the right, it's very small, but just to give you a visual, if we send you these, um, the two on the sides, the first one on the left is um, universal design recommendations for buildings and exhibits. So exhibits would be like a museum exhibit. So we've worked with some different um, organizations and entities that wanted a guide. And so we created a guide for them um, how to make their buildings more accessible and their exhibits. So that's on the left. And on the right, we have a guide for um, how to make an accessible presentation. And so there's lots of information online, um, but sometimes it's different. You go to different places. So we consolidated all that information into a presentation guide. Um, again, it's not on our website yet, but you could email us and we'll send you either of those. And then in the middle, we do have now up on the Community Vision website, um, a universal design guidebook. So this was made in partnership with some local architects here in Portland called Bora Architecture. Um, funded by Chase Bank. And it's a really cool guidebook around universal design um, for buildings and homes, um, wayfinding, just a lot of information around universal design. So if you go to the Community Vision website, you can find our universal design guidebook. We have a live link here. And we also have um, it linked here on our resource list. So these are just some of our favorite resources. Again, we have the universal, universal design guidebook, we have the presentation guide, um, recommendations for building and exhibits, the link to our AT funding page on our AT Lab website. We included CAST on here. You've probably heard a lot about CAST, who um, sort of the beginnings of uh, the founders of universal design, really. It's a national organization. We have a link to Sense and Sensibility, the money management guide, as well as study money. And then we included a couple links about self-advocacy. So we have S-A-R-T-A-C, SARTAC, and their link. And then we also have a link from ALSO, which is um, a kind of supported organization for adults with developmental disabilities um, in Oregon. And it's called What is Self-Advocacy? So we have some live links here of our favorite resources. And we also have our contact information here. So Deb has the slides available for you all. Um, so any questions or thoughts or anything? Whenever I asked you and Noelle to step up and do this presentation, Carrie, I wasn't sure what all you would be able to find and bring, but you brought some amazing resources and it's, uh, it's you know, things for people to practice with, uh, things for to bring people into. I, I love all of the tactile, the, the Louvre, um, all of the things that if I can't see it, then how are you going to help me to understand what it is? I just love um, that focus. Yeah, thank you. We didn't know where it was going to go either until we started kind of digging in. And, you know, we all we don't think about accessing materials outside the school, really. So it was a great um, project for us to dig in and think more about um, the community and accessing materials. And how you framed it is that just because you're not in a school doesn't mean it's not educational material, um, because it most certainly is. We, on a daily basis, we learn um, not just newspapers, but uh, anything that is print, we need access to. Exactly, exactly. And videos and now all the things, <laughs> the real, the Facebook reels, you know, there's just so many ways to take in information. And while people are formulating their questions, um, I, I love your community vision building and all that. Uh, I, I just want to encourage anybody, if you're ever in the Portland area, to go by and uh, probably schedule a time with Carrie and Noel to see their facility. But you've got some top rate um accessibility, uh, the kitchen that you have set up. Uh, it, tell us just a little bit about that in itself. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So we have one of the first universally designed buildings in Portland. Um, you can call to schedule an appointment or we are open to the public. The AT Lab is open to the public Thursday afternoons from 12 to 5. Um, and 
you can get a tour of our building and kind of the highlight is the kitchen on our top floor. It's a fully universally designed kitchen, some really great features. Um, we have a lot of pull out options. So the stove pulls out, um, the sink goes up and down. It's a high low sink. So it's not affordable for everyone to make these modifications in their home. But really what we're trying to do is move the needle on accessibility, getting architects and designers to think about this from the get-go um, and just really, you know, expanding the boundaries of um, building homes and making spaces more accessible. So give us a call, give us an email and come visit us. Oh, you're muted, Deb. You'd think we'd learn after a while, but no. Uh, so the supports that you provide, obviously, you're located in Portland, um, but you provide supports around the state? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So we have a free email and call line. So you can call or email us anytime. We usually get back to you within 24 hours, maybe 48 hours. Um, and if we don't have the answer to your question, we'll help connect you with a resource who hopefully does. Um, yeah, so anyone across the state can call or email us. Um, also our consultations can be in-person or virtual. So you really could be anywhere. And I know you and uh, Noel just did an amazing session, uh, again, um, uh, related to writing at our uh, conference, uh, our AT Ties conference. So, when you develop those type of sessions, are you doing that in partnering with schools and working in the classroom and helping them to determine um, strategies and best practices for um, for delivering? That's a great supports? question. Yeah. So at, at the AT Ties conference for a couple of years now, we've done writing for all with a lot of um, great writing strategies for all students. And so we bring experience um in our own practice. So Noelle came from um, the Multnomah Educational Service District. She was in schools for years. Um, I consulted with schools for years. So we bring our past experience, but yes, we're currently working with three different school districts now in classrooms. So it's also drawing from those experiences as well. Um, and we do contract with schools to provide trainings. It could be a single training, um, one district we've been working with for two years now. So it's really whatever folks need. Um, you know, we know districts are spread thin. And so sometimes bringing in those outside resources can be helpful. Um, we also look for matching grants. So for all of our districts now and a preschool that we're working with, um, they pay for our time, it, part of our time, and then we find matching grants for the rest of the time, since we know schools don't always have the budget. Well, you've talked a lot about universal design and really designing up front, knowing that we're going to have the diversity in, diversity in our classroom, not waiting till the kids are in front of us to do that. And so I know um, universal design, of course, in our tiered systems of support across our state, UDL is equal to tier one, what everybody should get. But I know that you've also done a lot of work in supports for, um, particularly for our more complicated kids, let's say in tier three. So I love the resources that you have, and I'm hoping we can convince you to um, share uh, another presentation in the future with us about writing for our most complicated kids. And you're just a wealth of resources, and it's a pleasure to partner with you. Yay. Well, thank you, Deb. And again, anyone reach out. We, we like to chat. Um, if you are in the Portland area, um, I'm going to give a little plug Noelle for your get togethers. <laughs> so Noelle um, supports a ton of speech language pathologists in the Portland area who are who work in AAC, so um, augmentative and alternative communication. So she's created a real community here. Um, if you're not in the Portland area, still reach out to Noelle. She's a great resource for supporting SLPs. So just want to give that plug. And our, our professional learning communities are um, happy hours. So we like to keep it real. 
<laughs> and then Cynthia runs our loan closet. So our loan closet is local. Um, we've actually had folks drive in from across the state to borrow some things, um, but we do have a local loan closet. So two um, weeks, up to two weeks, free loans of AT equipment. Oh, and we'll give a plug for Zetosh. So if anyone knows Zetosh funding, um, it's administered by three different organizations in Oregon. It's for educational equipment. And so it's administered by us at the AT Lab, OHSU, the Ocean Program for Families, and then UCP, United Cerebral Palsy. So we're the three entities that distribute um, Zetosh funding, which you can find on our website. Again, find that blue AT funding button and you'll get the Zetosh application. I, I believe we're going to be looking at um, for next summer, but we do I keep, think we use, yeah, we just used keep up applications on hold. And then one last plug, I promise this is the last one. I'm doing adaptive gaming consults. Um, one of my other passions besides literacy and communication is gaming and access to gaming for people of all ages. So even if you just have a question, um, shoot folks my way. Shoot folks my way. Shoot me an email. Send people. <laughs> there we go. All of a sudden, I just saw a cannon. With I know. Put them in a cannon and send them over. As long as I got a parachute in there. Well, I love that you're talking about that because when we talk about accessibility in our community, being able to share with gaming, whether that's in our own homes or in you know local facilities, whatever, uh, yep. that is something that I know Chandra is really passionate about as well. Um, I but. Can. We we, gotta, we always talk about AT, but we we always forget about the fun, right? Like, well, you what, have what to about be leader? part of that. That's right. I love that you're doing that. So, you know, being able to game with our friends and share that experience just is really a normalizing uh, activity. So I'm, I'm thrilled to hear you've got that kind of passion as well. Thank you. No more plugs, unless we can think of something else. <laughs>